Hi, I'm Katie, and I want to welcome you to the Faith Community YouTube channel. We're glad we get to spend a little time digging into God's Word together today. And if you haven't already, take a moment to hit the red subscribe button so you're the first to know the next time we post a video. Also, if you'd like to learn more about getting connected at Faith Community, stick around at the end for details. We hope you're encouraged to take your next step as you move from where you are to where God wants you to be. It's really good to be with you. I get the privilege of being one of the pastors here on staff. And as we continue in our Acts series, I was just reminded in worship, like, it it always fascinates me that we are playing out the very values that are being established right here with the First Church. The way we pray, the way we worship, the way we come together in this, because Do you understand, and and I know we've been in this series for a couple weeks, but the theme of it as Luke is writing it, we see is a dependency on God. That his believers, his followers are learning how to depend on who he is, not just when he is with them, but even now that he has ascended, that there is still a dependency on Jesus. And that the power of the Holy Spirit just illuminates what we believe, the values that we have been given so that we can carry those things out in the community in which we live. Because community is important, and I'm going to harp on small groups a little bit more, right? Because this is where you learn to live as Christ's followers. You encounter one another, and it's so beautiful to see because we're different. But even in that, we need each other. We need each other to grow and understand all of what Luke is describing in this. And like I said, we've been in Acts for a few weeks, and if you were with us the first week or you've been joining us online, you remember that Luke has written Acts and also the Gospel of Luke, um, and he's giving the account of what is happening at the birth of the church and how it's beginning. And it's believed that he wrote this between 30 and 60 AD, and it's really just telling the story of the believers kind of unifying together over their values, their personal values, the communal values that will play out in this, and how the church is formed and birthed with the power of the Holy Spirit. And in the first week, Pastor Josh really kind of laid out that personal value that was being built in the fact that they believed in Christ. They believed in Jesus and who he was, that he was the Son of God. They believed in the reality of his resurrection, not that it was just spoken, but that it was a physical resurrection. After all, over 500 people would see his resurrected body. And they would believe in the coming kingdom that he was offering. Now, for a lot of them, they may not have fully understood what that meant in the moment, but they believed that he was bringing his kingdom here on earth. They believed in the power of the Holy Spirit, even though they hadn't received it in that moment when Jesus talked about the helper coming. They believed, and they believed in his return, his coming again. And those were foundational personal beliefs that they had to solidify within themselves to cement what they were. And last week, Pastor Josh talked about who the Holy Spirit is, because we know as we venture into Acts 2, because for us, we get the opportunity to read ahead. Now, those living in this time, they didn't have that luxury, right? They were living this out. And so you can imagine there's a lot that's unfolding before them. But for us, we know the Holy Spirit is coming, but we understand who the Holy Spirit is, that he is God, that he's our helper. He reveals truth to us, and he empowers us to live a life that shows the kingdom, shows the values that are being established. And you might be going, Brian... So you're talking a lot about Acts chapter 1. Are we moving to Acts chapter 2 today? No, we're not. (laughs) We're still in Acts chapter 1. Do you believe that? Three weeks, and we can't even make it out of Acts chapter 1. But the beauty of that is, is because this is values that are being driven in. And like Pastor Tim said just a moment ago, these values are still being played out today in our community, and not just on a local level, but a global level. As the church, these are the values in which God established in his people, and there's so much in this. And what we're going to see today as we read through Acts, and we're going to look at the the last half. So after today, we will be out of Acts chapter 1, so you can take a breath and be good. But we're going to look at verses 12 through 26. I'm going to read from the NLT, but you need to understand these 
are the values. They've, they've had their personal values start to cement and take place in their lives. And these are now going to be the communal values, how they live out what Jesus is instilling in them. And we see this, and if you read the kind of the headline or the caption in some of your Bibles, it'll tell you that all they're doing is replacing uh, Judas with Matthias as a disciple, but there's so much more in that. So I'm going to read it all, all 14 verses. So hang with me, and then we're going to talk about what we see in the midst of this. Again, this is chapter 1, verse 12. It says, Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, a distance of a half a mile. When they arrived, they went to the upstairs room of the house where they were staying. Here are the names of those who were present. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, Simon, and Judas, not Judas that betrayed, another one. And they all met together and were constantly united in prayer along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, several other women, and brothers of Jesus. During this time when about 120 believers were together in one place, Peter stood up and addressed them. Brothers, he said, The scripture had to be fulfilled concerning Judas who guided those who arrested Jesus. This was predicted long ago by the Holy Spirit speaking through King David. Judas was one of us and shared in the ministry with us. Judas had bought a field with the money he received for his treachery. Falling headfirst there, his body split open, spilling out all of his intestines. That's great, right? We needed to know that. Uh, The news of his death spread to all the people of Jerusalem and they gave the place, the Aramaic name, Akdama, or if you know how to pronounce that, you can come talk to me. We'll figure it out together, which means field of blood. Peter continued, this was written in the book of Psalms where it says, let his home become desolate with no one living in it. It also says, let someone else take his position. So now we must choose a replacement for Judas from among the men who were with us the entire time we were traveling with the Lord Jesus. From the time he was baptized by John until the day he was taken, with, taken from us, whoever is chosen will join us as a witness of Jesus' resurrection. So they nominated two men, Joseph, also known as Justice, and Matthias, and then they all prayed, O Lord, you know every heart. Show us which of these men you have chosen as an apostle to replace Judas in this ministry, for he has deserted us and gone where he belongs And that sounds a little passive aggressive. Um, Then they cast lots and Matthias was selected to become the apostle with the other 11. That's a mouthful. And there's a lot in there. And I think sometimes if you're like me, we can be reading through this and you see the ascension of Jesus and you know chapter two is gonna start with the power of the Holy Spirit. And so you just kind of glaze over this and you miss some key establishments that are being made because what they're beginning to understand, the values of who Jesus is and their dependency on him, they're beginning to realize that it has to be formed in a communal state, in a community. And so they're beginning to solidify themselves not only as a bunch of individuals, but a community of believers. Because remember, it's not just the disciples here. The the script tells us that there were 120 in this place. And think about that. Because when you think even in a room like today that we're in, or if you're joining us online, there's so much diversity in here. There's different backgrounds. There's different beliefs. There's different ways that we choose to walk out life. And it was no different for them. There's diversity in this group. I mean, think about this. We get kind of a peak of this. Jesus' family is there in the upper room. You have the disciples, right? You have other followers, and we know. How many know and would agree with me on this statement? Where there's diversity, there's division, right? It's an easy place. When you have diversity in a room, it's an easy place, I should say, for division to grow, And I'm amazed that it didn't happen here. Because think about it. Jesus' family could have said, hey, look, we were close to him. We knew him. You know, maybe we didn't believe in him at first. But now that we see all this, we believe in him. And so we're going to deserve some special treatment. We need to have a say in all of this. And then the disciples might have been 
jumping up going, well, you know, really, we were with him the whole time he was here. And they may even be arguing amongst themselves, right? Because that wouldn't have been uncommon for them. Maybe they're looking at Peter going, you don't have a place here because you denied Jesus. John may be standing up going, hey, when Jesus was on the cross, he tasked me with caring for his mother. I mean, after all, he was the self-proclaimed beloved one of Jesus, right? There's so much opportunity for division, not even to mention all the others that were there. And yet we read that they were in unity, that they were unified. And I think that's a fascinating word because I think in in our day and age, our culture, that definition is like just broke. Like there are so many different definitions of unity out there. But when we look at scripture and we begin to dive in, what we find is is that when unity is mentioned, it's really these two words that it kind of gets translated to. And it's simply this, oneness or one accord. And oneness means this, of the same mind or spirit. And one accord means harmony leading to action. Harmony leading to action. And so we can hear that. And I think all of us in our minds, we can start to go to a place of unity is this. But can I tell you, unity is not uniformity. See, unity is not complete agreement on everything. Unity is saying that, hey, the main thing is the main thing, and despite my background, despite what I bring into this, I'm going to believe that Jesus is who he says he is, that he died on a cross, that he physically resurrected, and he's here for us today, and that's the main thing, and so that's where we're going to walk together in this. Now, I can have different opinions about all of that, but still be in unity with you. I can still love you and not agree with you, right? Think about it. If you're parents, you know that statement is true right there. I look at my daughters and go, sometimes I don't know what you're thinking. How did you get there? And I love them. And I still challenge them. See, I think sometimes we think that in unity there can be no challenge. No, there's still challenge in unity. But unity is coming together in harmony saying, hey, we believe the same thing, the core of who Jesus is. And that's what we're going to do together. We're going to walk this out together. Because can I tell you something? There's beauty and diversity because you're going to bring an idea, an avenue that I've never thought of. And it's going to challenge me to grow and move forward. And we need that. And this is what we're seeing right here in this. And I wanted to have some fun with this. Are you okay with that? Let's have some fun with this because I see some of you are squirming already a little bit in your seats, right? But let's just talk about this idea because here's the reality, and I just want to be honest with you, is simply this, is I don't have to affirm your life to love you. I don't have to affirm the decisions that you make to love you, to walk in unity with you. Now, there are, again, I'm not talking about the main things. Jesus And him crucified is a staple. It doesn't change. That's the foundation and the belief. But there are things that are tertiary. They're secondary. That salvation is not dependent on. And I don't need to believe the same thing that you do to work together to further the kingdom of of God. And some of you are getting really nervous because you don't know where I'm going with this. But let's have some fun with this, right? I can love you even if you're going to sit here and tell me today that you think the DC universe is better than the Marvel universe. (laughs) It's not. (laughs) You know? We can debate that later. If you're going to look at me and say baseball is less than football. No, it's not. I love them both, but baseball is better. Get a grip. We live in a baseball town. You might want to move out if you don't. I'm just playing. I'm playing. I can love you even if you think the King James Version is the only translation that needs to be read. I can. And it's okay. Because can I be vulnerable with you for a second? My wife and I in April are going to celebrate 21 years of marriage. I know, right? 
I'm excited about that too because she stuck with me that long, so it's good. But can I be honest with you? We don't agree on everything. Even theologically, we still have conversations that we just don't agree on. But the main thing is the main thing. Jesus and him crucified for us is the most important thing. And we've agreed to unify together to raise our family to follow Jesus. Despite some of the things that we may disagree or differ on. And that's what unity is, especially in our faith. See, I can love you and not love everything about you. It's okay. And you can do the same for me. And that's what they're building right here. They're learning how to believe in each other. That's the value. That's the communal value that's taking place. That's why it's so important for us to come together and be in a place like that. This is why it's so important for us to be in small group because it teaches us how to live in Christian community. That we're not always going to agree. And I love, as I was studying this week, a British pastor, his name is Roland Hill. I came across this quote, and it really just resonated with me. He said this. He said, I do not want the walls of separation between different orders of Christians to be destroyed. Think about that. But only lowered that we may shake hands a little easier over them. See, I don't need our Christian faith to become robotic where everybody thinks the same way, feels the same way about everything. Are there things that we have to come into an agreement upon? Absolutely. But what we need is unity. What the world is craving is a unified church, not just the local church, but the global church being unified for the mission of Christ. And we need to come back to Acts and understand that that's what the call of the church is, is to become unified, not to agree, right? You've heard this statement before, we're going to agree to disagree. Make that a staple in your life. It's okay. And that's what they're finding. And Paul would tell us in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1, he would kind of tell us how to do this. Because he would say this, therefore, I, a prisoner serving for the Lord, beg you to live a life worthy of your call. It's going back to the birth of the church, your calling to know Jesus and to make him known. For you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. That's a tough one. Making allowances for each other's fault because of your love. A little bit tougher. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourself together with peace. It's hard to do. And the more people you add to the mix, the harder it becomes because we're different. But you wanna know what's, what's fun? Because I think sometimes the hardest people to live in peace with isn't strangers necessarily, it's our own family. Right? Why? Because we don't have the grace for them that maybe we should. But understand what's happening here. Unity is a picture of who Jesus is. That's why it's so vital to the church. It's so important because it speaks of grace and mercy and forgiveness, all of who Jesus is. And when we're divided and divisive and passive aggressive, man, that doesn't show Jesus. And they're having to learn this. They're having to figure this out. Warren Wiersbe, who's an author, made this statement. He said, they had been given the responsibility of bearing witness to a lost world. And none of them could do it alone. Think about that statement. You can't do it alone. They couldn't do it alone. But it was not time for asking who is the greatest or who committed the greatest sin. It was a time for praying together and standing together in the Lord. As they waited and worshiped together, they were being better prepared for the work that laid before them. After all, Jesus would say this in John. He would say, they will know you by your love for one another. How you live in unity together is how people will know. The risen king, the savior of the world. And so think about that, because I think sometimes we get so caught up 
in secondary issues that we present a God to the world, we present a Jesus to the world that is divisive, that is backbiting, that is almost slanderous to a degree, and we don't realize it. Because can I let you in on a little secret? They're watching. They're watching. And we have to choose to believe the best in each other, to be unified together as one and walk this out. It doesn't mean we're going to agree. It's like we have a picture frame. It's a written word over our mantle in our house above the fireplace. And it just simply makes this statement. It says, others may, but we may not. And what that signifies to our family is is that we're going to walk in the call that God has called us to. Others may, but we may not. And what we're saying is, is it's not my job to judge them. It's my job to love them. God has called me to live accordingly to what I believe the Spirit is leading me to. And that may mean that I need to abstain from this or stay away from that. Whereas for somebody else, that's not the case. And my job isn't to condemn them or put them down for that. It's to love them. Can I offer challenge to them? Absolutely. But at the end of the day, I have to trust that the Holy Spirit does what the Holy Spirit does. And it's the Holy Spirit's job to reveal truth and correction. Can he use me? Absolutely. But I better make sure my heart's pure first. And that's what we see is taking place at the beginning of this. And it stems to a place of prayer because prayer is so powerful. And that's the next thing you see is that they believe in prayer, the power of prayer. Because it's so vital to understand their own heart. It's, it's personal and it's communal at the same time. We need both prayer types in our life. We need to be able to pray as individuals. But we also need to be able to pray as a church together and worship as a church together. And prayer in its simplest form is just put as communication to God. That's the simplicity of prayer. But there's so much significance in this. And I found this out as a high school student, and I was not living for the Lord at the time, um, but God doing what God does always kind of just broke through my rough exterior. I'd like to tell you I was a good kid. I was not. I raised a lot of hell um, in high school. Uh, And so how it started was my parents split when I was about two years old, and my dad remarried. And so my introduction to faith was really through my stepmom's family. When my dad got remarried, they were heavily involved in church, and I'm glad they were, but my grandparents on my stepmom's side came to live with us. I didn't like that, I'm gonna be honest with you. I didn't like it. And so as I was growing up, there was always this combative nature within me. I would fight them, I would argue with them, I would ridicule them, I would make fun of their faith, all of it. Like, that was me. And I gave them such a hard time And as God would have it, as we moved into a new house, getting ready for my high school year, a lot had kind of changed. They got the room right next to me. (laughs) Right. And so you can imagine, I would get up every morning getting ready for school. I'd have to walk past their room just to get to the bathroom. And all the trouble that I have caused them, you would think they were lobbying for another room. But what I would hear in the mornings, I wouldn't know at the time what would begin to realize would radically change my life was the fact that every morning I walked by their room, they were praying for me. And it wasn't vindictive prayers. It wasn't prayers of God, smash him, destroy him, mute him so he can't speak anymore. (laughs) That's not the prayers they were praying. They were praying prayers of blessing over me. They're saying, God, we know what's inside of that young man. We know what he can do, so bring people in his path. Give us a special ability to love him, even when he's at his most ornery state. And I watched my grandmother do that. I could literally wear the same clothes every day, and they'd be clean, because by the time I got home from school, my grandmother would come in my room, get those clothes, take them, wash them, fold them, and put them back in my bed. And I believe that was her way of expressing love to me. I didn't have to make my bed. I got married to my wife and I didn't know what making a bed was because my grandmother would do it. And she expects me to make the bed. And I'm like, I don't know how. But that was her way to love me. 
And every morning I'd get up and I'd pray. And so I, I say that to say this has to be foundational to what you believe. Prayer is important. And if you're in here today or you're joining us online and you've been praying, don't give up. Because it took years of prayer for me. But I believe I'm here today, yes, because of the will of God. And I believe he can reach anybody anywhere. But it was because of their faithfulness to pray. And see, the early believers, they were understanding that prayer was going to be a necessity to do what they needed to do. And I believe, I wasn't there, but I believe that in their prayer times, they're praying for the generation that they're walking into, the community that they're walking into, the nation that they're walking into. And they're not praying, God, just destroy them. They're praying, God, how do we reach them? How do we love them? All at the same time going, how do we make this group a representation of who you are to them? See, that's what it is. It's believing in each other. It's praying individually and corporately and in community. It's valuable because it changes things. And so if you're praying for someone, keep praying. Keep praying. Don't ever let that slide. Because I can tell you now, prayer has become such an integral part of my life. And it's not just relegated to certain times. I pray throughout the day. Like, I have found myself, like, I'm not a good, like, traffic driver, I guess, if you will. Somebody cuts me off. I want to wave at them and not the proper way. Um, I know I'm a pastor. I shouldn't even think that way. Uh, but I do at times. And, and I catch myself in that moment because of the Holy Spirit going, you know what? I don't know where they are. I don't know what they're going to. Maybe there's an emergency they're trying to get to. And the reality is, is they're probably not thinking about me. They weren't like, hey, I see the dude in the Bronco. Let's cut him off, <laughs> right? That's not their thought. But if I'm not careful, I go there. But I have found myself over the years after witnessing what prayer is through my grandparents that I know that I can pray, God, whatever's going on in their life, find them. I don't have to know them. Find them. And that's how powerful prayer is. John Bunyan, who's an author, said this, that prayer is a shield to the soul, a sacrifice to God, and a scourge to Satan. And I think we see that play out through the book of Acts. As we continue in our journey, we will see all of those play out. But that should be our life right there. And the final thing I just want to kind of share with you today is simply this fact is, is that they believed in the leading in God's of God. They believed in the leading of God. See, again, let's go back and remember, Jesus isn't with them physically anymore. So they're solidifying a new understanding of how to be led by God without him being physically present with them. And what's, excuse me, what's fascinating about this is we can seem and look at the way that they chose Matthias to be a disciple as an insignificant just way to do it. Because throughout scripture, what happened up to this point is as Christians would pray, they would ask God for direction, but then they would do a thing called casting lots. And if you're like me, your first thought goes to casting dice, right? And that's what they would do. And what it was signifying for them was just simply this. It's an impartial way to make a decision. Because they were going, we don't necessarily know what the right is. You look at these two disciples, they're going, these are two great men. We don't know how to distinguish who's right. So God, we're going to trust you. And that's what they would do. They would just cast lots. And then how it would fold up, we see Matthias got picked. So he became the disciple. But what's even more fascinating is when you begin to study the New Testament, you understand that this is the last time that it's ever recorded in the New Testament that the disciples would cast lots or Jesus' followers would cast lots to make a decision. It would go on to say that it seemed right to us and the Holy Spirit, so we decided. See, it's fascinating because they start here and they're doing what they're just used to doing. But as they begin to understand the power of the Holy Spirit, the work that God is doing within them, they begin to understand that they have his word. They have each other. They have his spirit coming that's gonna guide them in the direction that they were gonna need to take. And again, 500 got to witness Jesus resurrected. 
but 120 are in this room. 120. The population of the nation around that time was estimated to be anywhere, from, this is a wide gap, but anywhere from 600,000 to 4 million people. And yet 120, a minority, right? 120 were about to turn that whole nation upside down for Jesus. How would they do it? The power of the Holy Spirit. That's how they would do it. But before the power of the Holy Spirit could work, they needed to know who they were. They needed to know what they believed. And they needed to begin to live those out in their community. And that's what we see unfolding in this moment. And so what I want to do in closing today is give you an opportunity to just have a reflective moment. So Tim and Seth, they're going to come in here in a moment. They're going to lead us in a song. And what I'm going to ask of you is not to stand and sing along with them, but maybe to kind of close your eyes, maybe look at the floor or just kind of focus in on a spot and begin to ask yourself, God, open me up. Open me. Grow me. Teach me. Help me understand who you are and your truth. Maybe it's even saying, Holy Spirit, lead me to the reality of Jesus. Lead me to the truth of who he is. But don't stop there. Then go, how can I believe in those around me? How can I begin to institute prayer in my life and help me believe in God's leading, not my own, but his leading? God, what, it is, what, it, what is it that you have for me? Not only as an individual, but in community. So let's just take a moment to reflect on him.
Let your presence overtake my heart. And I want to know you. Let your spirit overwhelm me. Let your presence overtake my heart. I want to know you. Let your spirit overwhelm me. Let your presence overtake my heart. And I want to know you. Let your spirit overwhelm me. Let your presence overtake my heart. And I give you my God, I thank you. I thank you that you haven't forgotten us and you set these values in place so many years ago. But the reality is, is we need to be dependent on who you are, Jesus. We need you and we give you all that we are because as we do that, we know that your spirit that works within us will teach us, will grow us, will shape us so that we can represent you well to the world. And so help us seek you and seek to live in community with one another. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Thanks for joining us online today. If you're new here or made the decision to follow Jesus, we want to connect with you and let you know how to take your next steps. All you need to do is text NEW TO FAITH to 97000 and someone from our team will get in touch soon. To learn more about the church, visit our website at faithcommunity.co. You can stay connected on social media by following us at Facebook or Instagram. If you're joining us on YouTube, make sure you hit the red subscribe button and the bell icon so you're the first to know when new content is available. Another way we'd like to come alongside you is through prayer. We believe God hears us when we bring our needs to Him. So if there's something going on in your life that you would like prayer about, please let us know. You can submit a request through our app or send us an email. Thanks again for joining FC Online today. We'll see you next time.